Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Peterson Institute for International Economics this morning. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to introduce our guest, uh, Martin Gruenberg, uh, former chairman of the FDIC, currently a member of the board, um, and he's going to talk about uh, bank capital and the supplementary leverage ratio and proposals uh, by the Federal Reserve and the Office of the Controller of the Currency to modify that. Um, uh, just to give you a little background on our speaker, uh, Marty uh, has a law degree from Case Western Reserve and uh, after that he started in 1979 a distinguished career in public service uh, beginning on Capitol Hill uh, and working on banking issues. Um, in uh, 2005, he was uh, appointed vice chairman of the Federal, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, and in 2012, he became chairman of the FDIC. Uh, his term ended, his five-year term ended last year. Uh, and uh, President Trump has, has now appointed a new chair, but Marty stays on as a member of the board. Uh, and it's in that capacity that he wants to talk to us today. Uh, the topic of bank capital may seem a little, uh, you know, odd for international economics uh, uh, think tank to, to talk about, but in fact it's actually been a, a big uh, focus of our work uh, for the biggest, uh, most important institutions. There's a global market and uh, global standards matter and countries uh, meet in the financial uh, FSB and other uh, forums to discuss uh, uh, rules for, for bank capital, uh, and Marty's actually been involved in that too. And just last year, two of our uh, senior fellows at uh, Peterson Institute put out books on uh, bank capital and in fact uh, argued that if anything, we probably need more bank capital, even more than the newer uh, uh, rules uh, require. And so this is an, uh, I, I urge you to look at these books by our former uh, senior fellow Morris Goldstein and current senior fellow uh, Bill Klein uh, on, on bank capital. So this is an issue that is very, uh, very much uh, of, of concern to us here at the Peterson Institute. And so I ask you to welcome our, our guest, uh, Marty Grunberg, to talk about the enhanced uh, leverage ratio and possible changes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And Joe, thank you for that. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I really appreciate uh, the Peterson Institute giving me the opportunity this morning uh, to speak to you all on a subject I think of, uh, of great importance to the financial stability of the United States. A central lesson of the financial crisis of 2008 was that the buildup of leverage, in other words, reliance on debt at the largest financial institutions in the United States, increased the vulnerability of the financial system and was a critical contributor to the crisis. The enhanced supplementary leverage capital ratio. I know this sounds technical, I'm gonna to try to go slow <clears throat> and walk you through this, which is an unweighted measure of equity as a percentage of an institution's exposures designed to constrain reliance on debt, designed to limit leverage, was in my view the key post-crisis reform in the United States that addressed this issue of leverage. This capital requirement, which the federal banking agencies in the United States, the Federal Reserve, the controller of the currency, the FDIC, established after the financial crisis for the eight US global systemically important banking organizations. These are, that's GSIB for short, global systemically important banks. This is the issue I'd like to address today. On April 11th of this year, 
The Federal Reserve and the controller of the currency released a joint notice of proposed rulemaking, that's an NPR, notice of proposed rulemaking, to make changes to the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio capital requirement applied to the eight U.S. GSIBs and their federally insured bank subsidiaries. The changes would have the effect of reducing the capital requirement. These are not technical fixes. They would significantly weaken constraints on financial leverage in systemically important banks put in place in response to the crisis. According to the notice of proposed rulemaking, the proposed changes would reduce capital requirements at the lead federally insured banks of these eight GSIBs, these eight systemic banks, by $121 billion. This roughly 20% reduction in capital would benefit the affiliates, parent companies, and shareholders of these institutions. It would, however, make the banks themselves more vulnerable to disruption and failure. In my remarks today, I'll briefly address why the U.S. banking agencies initially implemented the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio and the strong performance of the banks that have been subject to it. I'll summarize the changes that have been proposed and their immediate and potential effects on the capital requirements of these institutions. And I'll discuss the case that has been made for the proposed changes and my serious concerns with the proposal. So if I may, let me start just talking about the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio itself and the reasons that the banking agencies adopted it. Runs by financial counterparties during the crisis highlighted doubts among market participants about the capital adequacy of many large financial institutions and their ability to meet their obligations and absorb losses. The loss of market confidence prompted the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the U.S. Treasury to implement liquidity programs and guarantee bank liabilities during the crisis, which mitigated the need for institutions to sell assets at fire sale prices. Collectively, the eight U.S. GSIBs and their affiliated entities had $434 billion of their debt obligations guaranteed by the FDIC during the crisis. In addition, the eight lead banks of these institutions utilized a separate FDIC guarantee of their large non-interest bearing transaction accounts with $436 billion of such accounts guaranteed as of year-end 2008. So in addition to these $870 billion in FDIC guarantees, by the, way, by the way, when you're on the hook for over $800 billion of guarantees, it tends to make an impression on you, I have to say. In addition to these FDIC guarantees, these GSIBs, these financial institutions, also benefited from an emergency U.S. Treasure, Treasury guarantee of their affiliated money market mutual funds, received large capital injections from the U.S. Treasury, and borrowed heavily under various Federal Reserve liquidity programs. The need for this unprecedented public assistance made it clear that the pre-crisis regulatory framework had allowed institutions to operate with insufficient capital and liquidity. In response to the crisis, the federal banking agencies in the United States adopted the Basel III capital rule, which for the largest institutions became effective in 2014. The rule strengthened the quality of bank capital and the level of risk-based capital requirements. 
It also required that large internationally active banks must, starting in 2018, implement a new supplementary leverage capital ratio consisting of tier one capital of at least 3% of balance sheet assets and certain off balance sheet assets. Now in the United States, the increase in capital requirements under Basel III was largely attributable to the higher risk-based risk capital requirements. The 3% supplementary leverage ratio was a significant development for banks in the many Basel Committee member countries, foreign jurisdictions, that did not have leverage capital requirements of any kind. In the United States, however, where banks had been subject to leverage requirements for many years, it was not nearly as significant a change. So it was this disparity between the substantial strengthening of risk-based capital requirements in the US under Basel III and the relatively more modest change in leverage capital requirements that led the US banking agencies to consider adopting an enhanced, an enhanced supplementary leverage ratio for the eight US GSIBs, for our eight clearly systemically important financial institutions. The agencies noted in the preamble to the proposed rule for the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio, which was issued in 2013, that a 3% supplementary leverage ratio, which had been on the table, would not have placed a significant constraint on the pre-crisis buildup of leverage at the largest US institutions. The agencies also noted that this disparity could allow institutions to benefit from active management of their risk-weighted assets before they breached the leverage requirement. So although the 3% international standard was a step forward because there had been no international leverage ratio standard before, from a US context, it really would not have made an impact in the run-up to the crisis. Based on these considerations, and the systemic importance of the USG SIBs, the US agencies implemented an enhanced supplementary leverage ratio capital requirement for them. Rather than 3%, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio was to be 5% at the GSIB holding company and 6% at FDIC insured GSIB banks. While the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio capital requirement had an effective date of January 1, 2018, all eight GSIBs have effectively been in compliance with it since early 2016. Now in calibrating this enhanced supplementary leverage ratio at 5% at the holding company, 6% at the bank respectively, the banking agencies described their approach as designed to achieve a comparable increase in the stringency of leverage requirements and risk-based requirements at USG SIBs. That was really at the heart of the proposal, rough comparability between risk-based and leverage capital requirements. The agencies noted that from a safety and soundness perspective, each type of capital requirement offsets potential weaknesses of the other. The risk-based requirements, while risk-sensitive, use risk measures that have at times dramatically underestimated risk and are subject to management. The leverage framework, while relatively simple, does not differentiate assets by risk and ensures banks hold a base of capital proportional to their exposures. The two frameworks in that sense are complementary, offsetting shortcomings in the other and work together to provide a stronger capital foundation than either would in isolation. That was the, the key concept 
involved in this measure. It is worth noting that the risk-based capital requirements are the binding tier one capital requirements at the bank holding company level for the four so-called universal banking organizations among our GSIBs. That would be Bank of America, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. The assets of those four firms comprise 78% of the assets of the eight U.S. GSIB organizations. The binding capital requirement, just to be clear, the binding requirement means it's the requirement that calls for the highest amount of capital when compared to the other capital standards. The enhanced supplementary leverage ratio is the binding tier one capital requirement for the holding companies of the two investment banks among the GSIBs, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and the two custody banks, Bank of New York Mellon and State Street. Now, for the lead federally insured banks, the federally insured banks of the GSIBs, which really the focus of my remarks this morning, the U.S. leverage ratio was binding, was the highest capital requirement before the adoption of Basel III. And similarly, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio is binding for the eight banks today. So I'm going to come back to this concept of the binding capital requirement because it's really at the center of this discussion. But it's important to understand that a binding leverage ratio at the bank level for these GSIBs was not new to the banking system. During the crisis, market participants gave credence to leverage capital and lost confidence in risk-based capital. In light of that experience, the question to ask is why should this straightforward capital measure that limits excessive leverage that was at the center of the crisis be reduced now? That's the question to consider, it seems to me. Now, let me take a moment to talk about the performance of these eight U.S. GSIBs since the implementation of these strengthened capital standards. As of March 31st of this year, the holding companies of the eight U.S. GSIBs held about $923 billion in Tier 1 capital, comfortably exceeding their aggregate Tier 1 risk-based capital requirements, which is $767 billion, and their aggregate enhanced supplementary leverage ratio requirement of $689 billion. Collectively, the largest U.S. banking organizations hold roughly twice the capital and more than twice the liquid assets relative to their size than they held entering the crisis. This makes them significantly stronger financial institutions that are less likely to experience liquidity problems or fail during a period of financial stress. It is a significant strengthening of the resilience of the U.S. financial system. How then has compliance with the strengthened risk-based and enhanced supplementary leverage capital standards affected the performance of these institutions and their ability to support U.S. economic growth? So let me just briefly walk through some of the indicators. Since mid-2014, after the Basel III capital rule became effective, and when these institutions first knew they would be subject to the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio, their financial performance and their support to U.S. economic activity has been notable. Between mid-2014 and year-end 2017, total loans outstanding, their lending activity, at the eight U.S. GSIBs grew faster than nominal GDP. The cumulative increase in nominal GDP during that time was about 13 percent. In comparison, the cumulative percentage growth in total loans outstanding 
at the eight GSIB lead banks where almost all the lending in the consolidated organizations that takes place was about 18%. The comparison suggests that on balance, the lending activities of GSIBs are supporting U.S. economic growth. The activities of investment banking subsidiaries of the eight GSIBs also have strongly supported U.S. economic activity. The bond underwriting activities of these institutions have fueled a record-setting pace of credit provision to the corporate sector during this expansion. Bid-ask spreads on bond trades, a standard measure of the cost of trading to market participants, have been at or near historic lows. The top five investment banks in the world by fee income have for several years been the investment banking subsidiaries of five of the U.S. GSIBs. Now, through their Futures commissioned, commissioned Merchant subsidiaries, the eight GSIBs have been actively engaged in derivatives clearing activities. As reported by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the volume of segregated funds for cleared swap customer accounts reported by the subsidiaries of the Future Commission merchants of the HE SIBs roughly tripled between 2014, mid 2014, and year end 2017. The market share in clearing swaps for customers of these Future Commission merchants whose parent companies all are subject to the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio increased from about 50% to about 80% during this period. Another measure of financial performance, this will be the last one, is bank earnings. The eight USG SIB holding companies earned $345 billion during the four years from 2014 to 17, with 295 billion of those earnings, or over 85%, attributable to the eight lead insured banks. Comparisons to the earnings of other U.S. corporations provide some context for evaluating GSIB's earnings. Measured by dollars of net income in the first quarter of 2018, all four universal banking organizations ranked among the top 10 earning firms in the S&P 500 companies. The aggregate earnings performance of the lead insured banks of the other four GSIBs also was noteworthy. Their aggregate earnings grew steadily through the four years. Combined earnings at these four banks in 2017 were 61% higher than in 2013, despite the large one-time tax-related write-downs that affected many banks in 2017. So in short, large U.S. financial institutions whose vulnerability necessitated extraordinary public assistance during the crisis are now among the strongest in the world. Their loan growth, bond underwriting volumes, bid-ask spreads on bond trades, volume and market share of derivatives clearing, and commercial and investment bank earnings all reflect their strong support to the U.S. economy. That's the performance context since the implementation of the strength in capital standards. So now I want to discuss the application of the proposed changes at both the bank level and at the holding company level, and I'll start at the bank level. In their April 11th notice of proposed rulemaking, the Federal Reserve and the controller of the currency proposed to change the 6% enhanced supplementary leverage ratio requirement at the insured banks, we're talking about the banks now, of the USG SIBs to a range of lower ratios from 3.75 to 4.75%. The 
The specific value within this range would vary by bank, with the percentage point amount above 3% equal to half of each bank's holding company risk-based capital ratio surcharge. And I'm not going to get into the details of the surcharge itself, but that's the, that's the reference point. Unlike the current enhanced supplementary leverage ratio, there would be no difference under the proposal between the bank and holding company requirements. By comparison with the current flat 6% requirements at the bank level, under the proposal, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio requirements at the insured banks would be reduced substantially. The effective change in capital requirements depends on the extent that other capital requirements, such as risk-based capital, would constrain each bank's ability to reduce its capital level. The notice of proposed rulemaking issued by the agencies states that as of September 30th, 2017, the amount of capital that the lead banks of the eight USG SIBs need to be considered well capitalized would be reduced by $121 billion. Applying the methodology described in the notice of proposed rulemaking, the effective capital requirements in aggregate at the eight US GSIB lead banks would be reduced under the proposal from 588 to 467 billion dollars. That's roughly a 20% reduction at these systemically important banks. That's the impact of the proposal at the bank level. Now let me turn to the impact at the holding company level. Now, by comparison with the current flat 5% requirement that applies at the holding company level, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio requirement at the holding companies would be reduced under the proposed rulemaking to the same lower range as that for the banks, between 3.75 and 4.75, depending on the GSIB surcharge for the company. The notice of proposed rulemaking stated that the aggregate estimated reduction in effective tier one capital requirements across the eight holding companies is about $9 billion, or approximately a 1% reduction on average. The small aggregate reduction at the holding company reflects that risk-based capital requirements are binding, the risk-based requirements are binding at the four universal banking organizations, which means that the change in the leverage capital requirement does not have an effect on them. However, for the holding companies of the two investment banks and the two custody banks, where the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio is binding, the reductions in capital are more meaningful. The Federal Reserve estimated in the notice of proposed rulemaking that after taking into account the effect of its comprehensive capital analysis and review pr program, that's the acronym CCAR or CCAR that you may have heard of, and its capital plan rule, the aggregate reduction in capital requirements would only be $400 million at the holding company level. Just by way of context, this CCAR program, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is the Federal Reserve's annual evaluation of the capital, capital adequacy of the largest U.S. bank holding companies using a stress testing analysis of the effect of assumed severe economic scenarios. Under its capital plan rule, the Federal Reserve may object or not object to planned capital actions by the covered companies, such as dividend payments or share buybacks. In effect, the Federal Reserve estimated in the proposed rulemaking that it would exercise its discretionary authority pursuant to these processes to prevent most capital reductions at the holding company level that would have been permitted under the regulation. So that's the impact of the proposal at both the bank level and at the holding company level. So let me now turn to the arguments made in support of these changes and, and the concerns I have with them. The most notable 
immediate effect of this proposed rule would be its $121 billion reduction in the aggregate effective capital requirements at the lead banks of the eight U.S. GSIBs, the eight systemically important banks in the United States. Two types of arguments have been made in support of these changes. One is an incentive argument based on the benefits of risk-based capital. The other asserts that whatever concerns one may have about lower capital requirements at the federally insured bank, holding company capital requirements and or this CCAR process should allay those concerns. I think those are the two principal arguments made in support of the proposal, and I guess I'd, let, let me address them. The incentive argument made in the proposed rulemaking is that a binding leverage ratio, when the leverage ratio is the highest capital requirement, discourages low-risk activities, and the proposed rulemaking identifies clearing activities for clients, secured repo lending, and taking custody deposits because the leverage ratio does not distinguish between high-risk and low-risk assets, the high-risk and low-risk activities and assets. The argument is that to avoid discouraging such activities by applying the same capital charge, the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio should be reduced so that it would no longer be the binding con capital constraint on the firm. It is argued that lowering the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio requirement will make banks safer by making risk-based capital with its incentive effects the binding constraint, in effect, the highest capital requirement. So there are three points I would make in response to this argument. The first and most fundamental point is that a bank's risk of failure depends not only on the risk profile of its assets, but on the amount of capital that it holds. The question is whether the assumed risk-reducing improvement in incentives that would, would offset the risk-increasing effect of operating with less capital. That's, that's the judgment being made here. Would the improved incentive effects of risk-based capital outweigh the value of the substantially higher capital requirements? The evidence suggests that the answer is no. Research on bank failures typically concludes that more capital reduces the risk of bank failure and vice versa. I know that's a shocking finding, perhaps, but that, that is the overwhelming uh, conclusion of the research that's been done in this area. Reducing the, the GSIB lead bank's capital by $121 billion would be expected to make them more likely to fail under stressful conditions, not less. Second, that's the key point. But second, it is worth noting that the incentive effects of risk-based capital can also be problematic. When the risk-based capital ratios are binding, or the highest standard, banks may tend to expend activities where the risk is underestimated by risk-based capital, and we've had some experience with that. Low risk weights may have encouraged the growth of highly rated securitizations of alternative mortgage products and related credit derivatives before the financial crisis, which were a significant contributor. And third, as noted previously, the eight USG SIBs have effectively been in compliance with the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio since early 2016. Judging by the firm's overall financial performance and market share in activities such as central clearing and custodial services, the evidence is not clear the extent to which the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio has impacted their participation in these activities. 
These activities were concentrated in the eight GCIFs before the crisis and remain so today. So this brings me to the second argument for this enhanced supplementary leverage ratio proposal that's been, been put forward. And that is, we shouldn't worry about capital at the bank level because holding company capital requirements and the CCAR process that I mentioned will essentially trap the capital at the holding company so it'll be remain available for the consolidated firm. So let me make two points in regard to that. First, regardless of holding company requirements, these are large reductions in capital requirements at the lead federally insured banks. If the capital reduction at the bank is paid to the parent company in dividends or otherwise transferred to non-bank affiliates, it may become unavailable to absorb losses at the bank. It's a heroic assumption to believe that once that capital is released from the bank, it will be available at a moment of stress. Just as a bank's capital is not available to absorb losses at affiliates, an affiliate's capital is generally not available to a bank. Parent companies have long been expected to serve as a source of strength to federally insured banks, which reflects the importance of safeguarding the subsidiary insured banks. I don't believe anyone has previously envisioned that the source of strength by the parent company should be bolstered by lowering the capital requirements at the bank. In effect, what is being proposed here is to significantly reduce the capital of the bank in order to serve the interests of the parent company and its affiliates. Finally, we should examine closely the premise that the capital released from the bank will be trapped in the holding company through the CCAR process. Notwithstanding the good intentions with which CCAR is, applies, is applied, it is a discretionary process that does not provide the same certainty as does a numerical capital requirement. Large banking organizations typically do not hold what they view as excess capital voluntarily and can be counted on to avail themselves of any flexibility afforded by the CCAR process. Given the discretion provided in the CCAR process and the eagerness of institutions to make distributions to shareholders through dividends and stock repurchases, close scrutiny will be needed for this going forward. So in conclusion, the proposed reduction in capital requirements at these systemically important insured banks is in my view a serious weakening of the post-crisis reforms. It is reasonable to assume that substantially lowering leverage capital requirements at these GSIB insured banks would cause them to become substantially more leveraged than they are today. Significantly reducing GSIB capital requirements will increase the risk of financial counterparty runs, reduce their ability to absorb losses, make them less able to lend in an economic downturn, increase their likelihood of failure, and increase risk to the deposit insurance fund. We are now in the ninth year of this economic recovery, the second longest on record. We know that recoveries don't last forever. It seems to me that the first lesson of the recent financial crisis for the federal banking agencies is to ensure that our systemically important banks are positioned to manage the next downturn 
whenever it occurs, without disruption to the institutions or to the financial system. Ideally, they should be able to sustain their lending activity to support the economy. Reducing the capital of these insured banks by $121 billion would be a failure to learn that lesson. I would hope, therefore, that serious reconsideration is given to this proposal. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, Marty, uh, for that very clear and thorough presentation. Uh, let me. Uh, uh, that's the highest, if I may say, that's the highest compliment. If, he, <laughs> if you're talking about bank capital and you can say to somebody that they've actually been clear, <laughs> that's the nicest thing you can do. Well, I'm glad. Uh, I, I realize I should uh, introduce myself, actually, because I have. I'm, I'm uh, Joe Gagnon, senior fellow here at the Peterson Institute. Uh, our president, Adam Posen, is not. Uh, is out of town today. Uh, uh, so uh, we have up to up to 30 minutes, no more and possibly less, uh, if, <laughs> to have a discussion and Q&A with the audience. Um, but I'd like to uh, kick it off uh, by pursuing you uh, a little bit more on the very final point that you ended before your conclusion, which was on the fact that although uh, viewed at the bank level uh, for, uh, for four of these, essentially four of these banks, um, there'd be a very large reduction in the binding capital requirement of the, from this proposal. Oh, no, for, for, all, for the, just to be clear, at the bank level, the capital reduction would be substantial for all eight. At the holding company level, it would only, the overall consequences substantially less for four, really none, and for the other four, uh, more substantial, but still not nearly as great. But for the eight GSIB banks, this is a substantial reduction of capital for all eight of them, just to be clear. Oh, okay, so um, all eight uh, at the bank level, uh, and, uh, and yet uh, the, the Federal Reserve says that it's, uh, uh, you know, procedures, the CCAR process, would actually not allow uh, the vast majority of that to be released uh, and would have to be trapped at the holding company level, as you say. I guess my questions are on that. Uh, does the Fed uh, have the authority to, pre to prevent the holding company from reassigning that capital to other affiliates? Uh, can it force the holding company to keep it at the holding company level? And if so, uh, and we know that holding companies have to be a source of strength to the banks, which means that some capital must sort of be there to support the banks. But does that, what is the legal precedent? Does that uh, require that all the holding company capital ultimately is callable uh, by the bank? I mean, what, I'd like to know more about that. I generally don't know uh, how much power the Fed has to uh, trap and assign that capital back to the banks. Well, I, I, I think it all falls under the discretion of the Fed in terms of the, the capital within the consolidated holding company. But the fact is, we, under this proposal, $121 billion of capital would be released from the bank. Where it would go in the first instance, frankly, would be at the discretion of the firm itself. And whether that capital goes to the affiliates of the firm, to the holding company, and uh, is going to be a business call for the firm itself, whether that capital can be released to shareholders from the holding company level uh, would be something that the Fed could impact 
um, but it's also a, a potential. But the bottom line is the capital is no longer at the bank. The bank is the uh, federally insured depository. It is the, in all of these institutions, the firm of greatest systemic consequence. And um, in a resolution scenario, which of course the FDIC has spent a lot of time thinking about how to resolve these consolidated systemic firms, the bank is the entity of greatest consequence. So from a systemic risk standpoint, from a financial stability standpoint, it seems to, to me that there's a compelling case to maintain the capital strength of these insured depositories. And look, candidly, both the banks themselves and the consolidated firms are doing quite well. I mean, what's, you know, what's the problem here? There, there, there isn't one, uh, but there is significant downside risk. And we have experience with that downside risk not that long ago. I mean, 10 years, I guess, is a long time to some people. Since I was on the board of the FDIC, it's a pretty vivid memory to me. And the notion that uh, we would substantially lower the capital of these systemically important firms at this stage of the economic cycle, after the experience we went through just 10 years ago, when a lack of capital was one of the key factors contributing to the crisis, as I said, to me, is to fail to learn a central lesson of the crisis. Okay, thank you. Now, I have one more question, but for those of you who want to ask questions, there's a microphone. We don't have a roving mic today. We just have a, a mic stand. So if you would like to ask a question, please uh, line up at the microphone stand, and I'll uh, call on you in order. But while you're thinking about your questions and doing that, let me ask one other question, which is, um, uh, again, this is really not uh, uh, my question. is a genuine question since I'm not a banking expert, but uh, I understand that there has been some new legislation uh, since the April proposal which uh, concerns the custodial banks and custodial operations, and I want to know how that interacts with this, how much of that um, uh, does that reduce some of the capital requirements there in a way that interacts with this or that supersedes this? Yeah, it's relevant because, as you know, there has been a law passed by Congress, so this is now in statute that would impact the capital of the so-called custody banks for the two GCIVs. That would be a Bank of New York Mellon and State Street. And it's a different approach that's taken in this proposed rule because this proposed rule affects what's called the, the numerator of the leverage ratio, meaning the capital required, reducing the amount of capital that has to be maintained. It gets pretty complicated, but I'll make a try here. The legislation affects capital, the leverage capital requirement by impacting the denominators, which are the assets that are uh, re required to be, to, to fall under the capital ratio and it would exclude a particular class of assets, central bank deposits. The effect of that by itself would lower capital for these institutions. How it will interact with the proposed rule is still an open question, and that's something I think, frankly, the agencies will have to consider, and will, in order to make a judgment there, we'll have to see uh, how it would be implemented. All right, thank you. So uh, as I turn to each questioner, please start by introducing yourself uh, and then uh, direct your question to Director Gruenberg. Uh, please do try to make sure it's a, a question and not a uh, monologue. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Neil Rowland, MLEX News. Uh, Marty, you're uh, outnumbered on the FDIC board by deregulators as Lael Brainerd is at the Fed. So neither of you is likely to be able to block uh, an adoption of a, a deregulated SLR. Okay, in fact, the FDIC 
which abstained from joining the two other agencies, as you know, under your leadership, will almost certainly join them. Therefore, I'm guessing your strategy is to pick and choose. Pick and choose a provision or provisions that you can affect of the overall rule. What is your plan? I mean, what provisions are most important to you of the proposal to try to change? And how do you hope to try to change them? I think you're talking about proposals in addition to this leverage capital proposal, or in this leverage capital. Well, look, it's, uh, I, I, I see no reason to lower capital for these systemic firms at either the bank level or the holding company level. There's just no reason for it. And there is experience that suggests there's a compelling reason not to do it. But clearly, the big consequence of this proposal is at the bank level. So to me, that would be the priority for this proposal, that the capital at the bank level should not be reduced by $121 billion, should not be reduced uh, by roughly 20%, making these insured depositories, which benefit from the public safety net, significantly more vulnerable. That would, and that's really why I'm giving this speech, to try to make that point as clearly as possible, because I do think there's really a, a compelling public interest here in preserving that capital at these large systemic banks. Hi, I'm Brent Sutton from the University of British Columbia. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I've got one technical question and one speculative question. So the technical one is short. Does the proposed regulations bring US regulations in line with the Basel Committee, or do they still exceed the Basel Committee even under the proposed reduction that's being offered? The second question is, you've made a compelling argument on, you've made a compelling case that none of the arguments that they've put forward actually stand in terms of the justification for making these changes. So in your view, what is the real motivation behind this? Is it simply ideology that we're dealing with a new administration? Is it that the banks are concerned that they aren't making enough profits, they're only making 10% versus 15% ROE, which is what they were making before? Um, are they losing business internationally because US capital standards are higher than what they are in other countries? I just wondered if you could speculate a bit on that. In regard to the second, let me just say that I really take face value of the argument. I just respectfully disagree with the recent comments. And on the first, you know, the US remained, it remained volatile for six months. We made the judgment as I indicated, that on the leverage side, particularly, that we wanted a substantial slowdown over the intervening period. Because the experience leading up to the crisis indicated that the international community would not have made a difference. So we very intentionally established a standard in the United States above the intervening which we have the flexibility to do under the international order. And it seems to me that that was a very prudent measure for us to take in light of the experience we had. Before uh, Morris gets to ask this question, let me uh, further respond to your question, because we invited uh, representatives of the Federal Reserve and the Office of the Control of the Currency uh, to this uh, uh, session, but they haven't sent anyone. Um, but I did speak with uh, someone at the Federal Reserve uh, in the area. I, I won't say who, but at, at a high level. And um, I agree with uh, what Marty said, that I would take what they say at face value. I, I don't see, I think that they are uh, a little bit surprised, uh, I think, but because I think they, uh, take, I guess they believe that their CCAR approach to keep basically trap all the capital at the holding company means that this isn't a very big change. And I think, as Marty just said, well, it may be a bigger change than they think. Certainly, from your perspective, uh, uh, I can see where it is. And to me, it all, it all, it really matters greatly whether the Federal Reserve has the strength of, 
of will to continue and ability to, to trap that capital and use it for the banks. And, um, and the FDIC is less, <laughs> is less certain that they will continue to feel that way. So uh, this is the issue. The Federal Reserve, uh, from its point of view, says that capital will still be there, but in fact, it, will, it isn't quite the same. So uh, uh, the Fed doesn't see this as a big deal. Uh, but from other people's perspectives, it is. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Morris Goldstein, uh, PIE, uh, retired. Um, I thought that was an excellent talk, Marty, and I want to thank you uh, for it. Uh, let me just mention and see if you agree uh, three additional arguments as to why this proposal is misguided. One, uh, we have a lot of empirical evidence, really a lot, uh, on the ability of risk-based capital standards versus leverage ratios to predict bank failures. And for large banks, particularly the GSIPs, what that evidence shows is the leverage ratio does much, much better. In the run-up to the crisis, it was sending the right signals, whereas the risk-based was sending the wrong signals. Second of all, if you look at the relationship between capital ratios and loans, uh, what you find is that the better capitalized banks lend more, not less. Quite the opposite of the general, I would say, Trump administration uh, uh, argument as to why we need this. And third of all, if you look at the cost of capital increases, and I'm talking about ones much larger than the ones that happened with the enhanced supplementary leverage ratio. What you find is the effect on economic growth is totally tiny. I mean, it is trivial once you take effect, take account of the effect of higher capital on the cost of debt, which a lot of the traditional studies don't do. We have some new studies that does it. So to make a long story short, uh, I would go even further than Marty. I, I think there's absolutely no evidence for this, uh, for this proposal. I think it's just a, simply a giveaway to the large banks at the risk of much higher taxpayer exposure. Uh, it's, it's totally a sham. Well, um, so much for the rule about uh, <laughs> questions and not monologues, but uh, <laughs> I am sympathetic, so. Uh, and <laughs> uh, any other? We can uh, end our meeting uh, a little early unless anyone has any other questions. Okay, well thank you all for coming and thank you especially to Marty for a very clear and uh, well articulated presentation.